This is called the Cornell method of note taking. Okay, Cornell, it's a Ivy League university. So uh, sounds pretty good so far. There are medical schools and I think some uh, legal, I don't know what, what do you want to call it, law schools. Uh, these are schools where you have already gone to college and now you're going to learn how to be a doctor, you learn how to be a lawyer. I mean, you made it through all of high school, you made it through uh, undergraduate, and you're, you're off to medical school, and there are medicals that require their students to take notes this way. There are notepads you can buy. There are Cornell method note-taking notepads, okay? All I'm trying to do here is sell you on the idea this might be a good way to take notes. Very good way to take notes. All right. So maybe you're buying into it. Uh, like three or four lines above the bottom, give yourself a line across like that. Go ahead and do that. Especially people I can just look at and see if you're doing it or not. Just four, three or four lines above the bottom. Go ahead and give your line across. Right there. Okay, you're going to write a few sentences, but that comes later. Okay, over here, you're going to write brief little questions or tidbits, useful information for you, uh, but mostly I'm going to emphasize the questions, okay? So however much room you think you need to, to have enough room to write questions, give yourself a little border right there. Okay, you don't want it to be half your page, but you don't want it to just be like the margin that's made by that red line, that's too small, and there's holes there. Okay, okay so take your notes however you take your notes, right here, okay? You just write along, you're taking your notes. Here's the key thing, that if we could take all the times that our brain was confused and reverse that, well, we could call that learning, right? If our brain didn't understand something and then we fixed that and our brain did understand that thing, we'll have learned something, okay? So you need to keep track of all the times that your brain was confused about something, go back and unconfuse it, okay? Pretty simple. So right here, when you're writing along in your notes, and you have any question, any confusion, anything pops into your head, okay, that your brain gets a little bit hung up on, okay, write that right here. Absolutely anything simple or complex, big or small, write your question down, okay? If it makes sense, just keep writing. You're like, I got it, this is good, all right? But if any time you just, why did you do that? Uh, what does that mean? How did you know you were supposed to do that? Okay, those kinds of things. Uh, write a little question, and then I hope at the same time you're writing it, you're raising your hand and asking a question. Yes, you got it. Are you supposed to be like doing those squigglies and uh, question marks? No, no, no. This is just a guide. Like, this is to represent that you're writing your notes, and this is to represent a question that you write. That it's your own question. Okay, but that I mean, even if you were taking a note on how to take notes, that would be a question. Does he mean squigglies? You mean writing squigglies? You're writing a question like that. You ask the question, and I say no, okay. And then, so the answer for that was no, and you give yourself a little, no, that's not what you meant. Okay, anything like that, any question that comes up, you write it down, get the answer to it as soon as you can, okay? From me, uh, from previous party notes, from the previous example, from your book, wherever it can come from, feel free, of course, to raise your hand in class and ask for it. Okay, so get that answer. Okay, so we got that one answered. We continue to take our notes. Oh, something else was confusing. Okay, the great thing about having a question is it is a signal from your brain saying, I did not understand that. There is something that is confusing about what just happened. And when you write that down, you keep a, you're keeping a log of all the times, all the things that your brain is confused about, right? Remember how we said, if we can take all the things that our brain is confused about, reverse that, and we'll have learned something. So this is part of that. Figure out when your brain is confused, write down all your questions. Okay. Even if it's answered immediately, your brain had that question, so write it down. Do your brain a favor, help your brain out, okay? And you're writing along, and you finally get that question answered, here's that answer, and give yourself a little indication it's an answer to that question, okay? So as we're writing along, and we're writing questions, and we're getting answers, and we're saying which answers go to what question, when you're done with the page of notes, you have is something that's very helpful in reviewing what happened that day. Okay, because what do you have over here? A bunch of stuff that your brain said, I'm not so sure about that. I would like you
you to answer this question here. Okay. All the other stuff that didn't have questions, if we did write down all the questions, we wouldn't skip any. All that other stuff, we get it. Okay. It's kind of a review of stuff we've already seen. We were confused about it. It made sense. Okay. All the times you were confused, you've kept track of all of them right here. And you can just go and cover this up, and then go back at the end of the day after school and read all those questions. Can you answer all those questions? Well, it seems like you learned something, right? Your brain is no longer confused about those things. Can you go back the next day? Can you still answer those questions? Can you go back in a week and still answer those questions? Well, you probably learned it pretty well, okay? As soon as you can't answer one of those questions, whether it be right after school or the next day or the next day, you look right down there, it's the answer, no. But there's the answer, whatever the answer to your question is. Whatever it is, you, you decide. Everybody's notes are gonna look different. You ask a question, you answer the question, now you have a study guide of questions that are important to you, okay? You're not looking at questions from me that are really obvious, you know them. They're questions that you made up and that you need to know the answer to, and as soon as you can answer all those questions, well, you're pretty far down the road of learning whatever it was that we learned in that class. Okay, so there's that. That's very, very useful. Down here, we have a summary. So far, all we've done is really taken notes, ask questions, put the answers to those questions. Really easy stuff, just with the flow of class. Right here, we need to take a minute or two, read over these notes. Maybe this is at the end of class, towards the end of class, uh, at the end of the day when we're on the bus. You know, just read through your notes real quick. Look through all this stuff, pull out the key elements, and put together two to maybe four sentences. Okay, try to be brief. By being brief, you're causing your brain to take all this information and compact it, okay, and decide what's important. Okay? So you write two to four sentences about this. For one thing, you can flip through your notes and you can read what this page of notes is about. So you know that it's useful in studying for that, that particular topic. But also, like I said, when you make your brain, force your brain to take the information and compact it down to two sentences or three, um, that process that your brain goes through just processes the information in a different way, and it's a very significant, powerful tool. All right, so there you go, the Cornell method. Doctors are forced to do it. As far as doctors are, they are we're told how to take notes. It's a medical school, and that's how it's done. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, a few things just to get us started on our review of past material, things that are always an issue. Okay, And let's just take time at the beginning of the year to clear them up. If you understand these things, deepen your understanding. If you don't, it's a great time to start, okay? And I really emphasize the why, right? not the how, but more the why. Do you get the difference between how and why? Yes? It's like um, how you did that and then the why you did that. Right, how you did it is, well, I'll just copy you and recreate what you did, right? And I hope I can copy the process in some other new situation. But the why, if I know why you uh, add five to both sides, or if I know, why you need to find a common denominator, if I know why when we multiply fractions we go straight across, then it's, then it's really there. Then you really understand. And when you can take something you understand and even teach it to somebody else, then you're an expert. You know what you're doing. Would you be surprised to learn that every year people, yes? Wait, do we have to use this in here? I'm not going to force you to take notes. I'm going to force you to take notes in a certain way, but it is a really good way. And Think about doing that. Okay. okay. I'm not going to check your notebook. Uh, I'm not a medical school. I'm also not your mom. <laughs> I'm not your own brain. You decide what's best for you. Okay. Yes. We get to use the notes for like tests and stuff, or uh, if at all, very rarely, if ever. Okay. Yes. Uh, what's the system that we <laughs> What's that? What's the subject of these notes? Uh, well, we're going to talk about fractions for a bit. So Do we need to take on. notes on this? Yes. Sure. So there's a little bit of a good idea. Um, so, 
Would it be surprising if I told you that every year you struggle with fractions? Problematic thing. So let's start talking about what a fraction is and what it means and how we can even visualize it so that we're one step closer to it not being as confusing. Okay? Fractions don't have to be an intimidating thing. Just numbers. If you want to add 2 plus 3, you can add 4 7 plus 3 and 456. Like it's, they're the same thing, just numbers. Okay? If you want to compare things, you can add fractions. So let's start with just this fraction, 3 fifths, and uh, talk about what it all means. So let's talk about first this guy right here and what's its proper name? Yeah. A denominator. A denominator. does the denominator tell us, you know, if we're talking about three-fifths of, of a pie or a pizza, okay, so give it some kind of a context, an actual object to think about, what does the denominator tell us about this physical object? The sections, it's cut into. sections it's cut into. How many of these sections? So there's five sections. What can I do with these five sections? What's that? Oh, I just said eat them. Okay, if they were pie or they were pizza, you could eat them. I'm trying to get names here, so Drew. Uh, they go into a hole. Yes, they go into a hole. There's five pieces in a hole, pizza, or whatever it is, right? And a dollar or a pie or whatever. So I'll try and divide this into five pieces. The, the, the denominator tells us how many pieces it takes to make the hole. Um, take it that way. That's what it tells us. It tells us how big the things are, tells us how many it takes to make the whole. Okay, we're probably not breaking new ground here, but we're trying to bring it all together in one context. What is this guy here? What's its proper name in a fraction? Numerator. The numerator. Not the top. <laughs> this is not the bottom. Numerator denominator. What does the numerator tell me about this pizza? How many sections of the whole? Three pieces, right? But that could really mean a lot of different things. Got three pieces. How big are these pieces? Well, that's what the denominator tells us, right? Does that make sense? Got three pieces that are a half size each. We could have three pieces that are a hundredth size each. These are very different things, right? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. So if I have three half pieces, it's a lot more than if I have three hundredths. Three pieces that are one one hundredth each. So then, if we talk about three fifths plus mm, two thirds, if we're concentrated on the why, we're going to ask why do we need to find a common denominator. If we're concentrated on the how, we might say, am I supposed to find a common denominator? And how was I supposed to do that? And I can't remember how to do that. Uh, and if you're really having a bad day, you're concentrating on how do I add these fractions together? What do, you, what do you think is a really common mistake? What might be a wrong answer I would get, Drew? Uh, they put the common denominator, but you don't need one. We don't need one? No. What do we got, we got over here? Would you add the denominators? That would be like a common mistake, you're saying? Yeah, you would get uh, five eighths would be a really common thing, mistake to make. Okay. Question, Drew? No. Okay. Uh, that would be a really common mistake. Let's talk about why somebody who gives that answer 
not anything against that person, but they're really not thinking about why do I do what I do? And why would I add the numerators and the denominators? They're just doing it because they think they remember how to do it correctly. Yes. So like if, like you said, you need the common denominators for this, if the three fifths is related to that, yes. or whatever, yeah. and the two thirds is related to all the different pi. Well, different kind of pi, because that pi. It only has three. Three pieces. Yeah, these are way different things. Apples and oranges, right? We like trying to add three apples to two oranges. It'd be a difficult thing to say we have three apples and two oranges, so we have five apples. No, we don't have five apples, we have five oranges. Do we have five apple oranges? No, we don't have any five apple oranges. Okay, so, and if we say fruits, then, well, you're just pointing out my analogy isn't perfect, right? But finding five, saying five fruits is kind of like finding a common denominator. Those are fruits, sir. <laughs> but we've gotta do better, we've gotta do better. So let's see, visually, what we're doing when we find a common denominator, which is indeed what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to find a common denominator. Uh, but we want to see why. And we want to see when we're doing, you know, finding a common denominator. What's going on? Like, what will be going on in the physical world as we find common denominators? So let's look at three fifths. Let's look at two thirds. Is Just to overemphasize what's already been said by some of you, we'll try to take three of these, and add two of these, and say we have five of something. That's not really going to work out. If I say, hey, let's let's split some pie, right? And I say, <laughs> here's yours, your piece, and here's my piece, right? They're both pieces of pie, so we're both happy, right? No, not quite. Right? That's not fair. They're different. You're getting this small piece, I'm getting this big piece. So to say we add them up, we have five pieces, that'd be like saying we have five fruit. That doesn't quite get where we're trying to go. Um, so how is it, and without saying the rote, memorize, find a common denominator, what would we do in the physical world? Like if we wanted to split this up, um, well, I don't want to say split it up, it's kind of confusing. But if I want to see how many pieces I have in total so that I could split it up, between some people. Yeah. You cut the all of these big pieces into small pieces. These big pieces, are these big pieces, right? They're big now. Let's cut them down smaller. We'll cut down these into a few pieces and these into a few pieces so that when we get done, each piece, each uh, pie, or whatever you want to call it, is now in the same number of pieces, right? And when we find the same number of pieces for both pies, what do we just find? Common denominator. Common denominator. Without speaking common denominator speak, we're, we're still just talking about pies here. What would I do with this pie and with this pie to each of the pieces so that I wind up with the same number of pieces? Uh, cut them in half. Cut these in half? Yeah. And then cut these in half? Yeah. Let's see, okay. Cut these in half, 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 half. How many pieces make up this whole now? Uh, well, there was five to start with. Cut them in half. Ten. Ten. Okay, what do we do over here? Cut them in half? Half, half, half. Oh, six. Okay, this makes this is made up of ten, this is made up of six. They're different sizes. So let's go back. Let's undo those marks. Okay, we got the right idea though, right? Take each of them, cut them up in half. Um can we cut the first one in half? No, yeah. Yeah. Cut them into halves. Like that. good though. This is six. Is there any way that we can take these five pieces and turn them into six pieces just by cutting them up? No. 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 So what do you suggest? I feel like I, I think I know what common denominator is. I just, like, so what did you, you're cutting up these pieces in your head? Yeah. yeah. Okay, how many pieces do you cut these into? Alright, you, you, uh, I think you each cut one. Each of them, yeah? Yeah, you cut them into a total of a 15 slices. Okay, so each of them I would cut into um, three, three. So I go to each of these, I cut them into three pieces. Three there, and three there, three there, three there. Can I get that same number of pieces by cutting these up? Like, 
all matches up nicely. We kind of meet you to five. five pieces each. Yes. What did we just find? Um, the common denominator. That's all the, that common denominator is. So often when I talk to students about common denominators, it sounds to them, you know, it's, it's hard because I'm not in their brains, I can't read their minds, but it sounds like it's this mystical thing. It can't be understood, but it could be understood. The common denominator is just, let's cut the holes into the same number of pieces so that when we try to go and compare them, add them and subtract them, it works and it makes sense. I don't want to add two apples and five oranges together, and I don't want to add three fifths and two thirds because they are different things, okay? And if, at, at the very least, if that's what pops up in your head, you try to add two thirds and three fifths together, and your brain says, no, those are different things. You can't put those together, they don't compare. That would be a great thing to have happen. Okay? Just for your brain to say, no, no, no. You can't put those together. That doesn't make sense. They're different things, like apples and oranges, trying to put those things together. Until these are the same, same size piece, pieces, we, we can't do anything. So what did we just do? We took each of these five pieces and cut them into how many each? Three each. So the total number of pieces is well, five groups of three, five times three. Here we came over here, we had three pieces, one, two, three. We cut them into how many? Five. five. Excuse me. To five each, three groups of five. Uh, five groups of three, three groups of five. We just made 15 pieces for each. Okay. So we, we found the common denominator. We know how many pieces each one should be cut into. We found the number that they both go into, right? Go into. Phraseology that, that I don't love very much, but three goes into 15 and five goes into 15. If we both go into 15, now we can take them both to having 15 pieces each. All right. Now, what did we say this number meant right here, up here on the top, the numerator? Yeah. Um, it means how many we have. How many of those size pieces do we have? Well, I don't have three 15s anymore, right? Because those three pieces each got cut into pieces themselves. How many pieces did they each get cut into? Five pieces each. Oh, sorry. Five pieces cut, cut into three pieces each. Okay. So I had three of these fifths, but now they're fifteenths. So each of those three was worth five each, though. So how many do we have? We could count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Or we could just say, well, each of those three pieces have been cut into three pieces. So we have a total of nine of those things. Nine of those what? What are they? Yes. And how big are they? Tiny, exactly how big? Fifteenths, right? How big are they? They are as big as 15 of them. Take, you know, it takes 15 of them to make the whole. Come over here. We used to have two of these thirds, but now they're cut into fifteenths. How many fifteenths is two thirds? Well, each of those two pieces was cut into five pieces each. So we multiply by five. So now we have. Nine fifteenths. That's how many three fifths is. That's the same as nine fifteenths. Plus ten fifteenths. That's how many one two thirds is. And now we have. We can compare them. They are the same thing now. They're the same size, so we can compare them. We can put them together. We can say one is bigger than the other. We can do all sorts of things. So now we have nineteen fifteenths. So like I said, at least I hope that if you try to add them by just going straight across or something like that, your brain says, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Hold on, those are different things. Don't do that. I would, I would much rather you just not do anything than add them together that way. Because now you're just training yourself the wrong way. You're going to have to unlearn that, get deprogrammed, and learn the correct way. And even better would be if you could sit down with a fifth grader that you're tutoring and explain to them why. You find a common denominator. Um, then what's an improper fraction? Well, improper, that sounds so bad. Yeah. What's improper about it? That is a big number of It's not a huge head. Okay. Though that, it's a bobble head. It's a bobble head, okay. So the number, then the numerator being bigger than the number of the denominator, we call it improper. 
like it's an improper sounds like it's such a, a bad thing, but really, that's a improper. I mean, improper fractions are actually a lot more useful than improper fractions. Or sorry, than proper fractions, mixed numbers, right? They're much more useful this way than the other way. If I call this uh, one and four fifteenths, then that's good. If that's like my answer, I want to say like I have one for one one and four fifteenths gallons or one and four fifteenths dollars. I want to know how many whole things I have and how much of the of the next whole I have. But if I actually want to use it and add it to another fraction, what do I do with a, a mixed number if I want to add it to another fraction? Make it improper. Yeah. And then what do I do if I want to multiply it by another fraction? I turn it into an improper fraction. So for that reason, in this class, I don't care if you leave it improper, I don't care if you put it in mixed numbers, they're both right. Why do we write 19 fifteenths as one and four fifteenths? Because they are worth exactly the same, right? So that is to say, if you don't know how to make it a mixed number, you should really practice, because that's something that's pretty basic that you should be able to do. Uh, just don't want to go through the trouble of telling me 19 fifteenths is 1 and 4 fifteenths, that's fine too. Uh, as you get into higher math, the, the truth is it's more and more abstract, and all we care about is the number. What is, what is the number that we find? Okay. Um, most likely we want to take that and use it to do something else. All right, so we've added some fractions. Of course, we can subtract fractions and do the exact same thing. We find a common denominator, and we know why we do it now. Do we have some new insight at all? These fractions? Mm -hmm. Anything new? You knew it all? I knew all this. Okay. <laughs> Just like, yeah. Just like. Um, well, if a couple of you gain any new insight and it does help you understand the why of it a little bit better, that's the goal here. Okay? Um, particular I want to talk about what is a very common mistake in multiplying fractions and at least why you can prove or how you can prove yourself that couldn't possibly be correct. Right? So let's take um, uh, three fifths times um, five sevenths. No, I like five sevenths. Three fifths times. No, how is a multiply fraction used together? You just multiply them, so six times three is eight times, so one times five. Right, very simple, simple thing to do. Okay, have mistakes ever been made in multiplying fractions? Certainly. What do you think the most common mistake would be? Okay, that would be not so much incorrect, but making a lot more work for yourself. Right, because when you find common denominators, we haven't, I mean, they're the same size, we have just as many, and now we just have to simplify after we're done. There's just more work. But that is, I mean, that's kind of a mistake, but it doesn't give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Forget to reduce? Um, no, it kind of goes into the same thing. You know, you can, you can, I want you to simplify, but it doesn't make it wrong. How do we, what's a common way to get a wrong answer in multiplying fractions? Like cross multiplying. That's the one I see a lot. What happens? Three times seven is twenty-one. Five times six is thirty. Okay. If you've never done that, you're good. If you have, let's. Well, let's at least for this, the short time we have, let's at least show you that couldn't possibly be right. And then we'll get into where is that coming from? Why is that in your brain? Because. Have you heard of cross multiply before? Yeah. Okay. Do you have trouble remembering what it's for? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, let's get into. We don't need to pack up yet. We have lots of minutes left. Okay. Let's just chill out. Um, so I'm going to show you and at least prove to you that this couldn't possibly be right. All right. Let's start over a little side note here. Two times three is what? And three times two is 
What did I do? What's the difference there? Switch the numbers, it doesn't matter, right? When I multiply numbers, it doesn't matter. If I switch them, I should get the same result, the same product. So if that's true, I should be able to switch these numbers that I'm multiplying together, these two fractions, and get the same answer, because that was the right way to go. Let's see. Put the six sevenths over here, three fifths over here. Follow this cross multiply mentality. Three times seven is twenty-one, so it's going six times five. That's thirty. Cross here seventy-three, and we get twenty-one. What are these fractions called? To each other. Reciprocal. That's reciprocal. So the reciprocals. So the, pro the result is, the conclusion is, cross multiplication couldn't possibly be the method for multiplying fractions together. Because if it were, we should be able to switch the order of the numbers, multiply them together, and get the same thing. But we don't. Okay. So if you're thinking, how am I supposed to, put, how am I supposed to multiply these fractions? Cross multiply? No. I know that if I switch the order of these two fractions and I do cross multiply, I won't get the same answer. So at least I don't do that. Better to not do a wrong thing. Okay? It's better to just not even progress than to do something you're sure is wrong. Right? Let me just quickly show you what cross multiplying is for. Let's say that I can wash three cars in five hours. All right? Three cars in five hours. We're talking about full detail here. Three cars in five hours. The question here would be something like, how many cars can I wash in 17 hours? Right? There's 15 hours. That's so easy. All right, 17 hours. So what do we do? We say 3 is to 5 as x, the number of cars I want to find out, is to 17 hours. Then we cross multiply. 5x equals 41. We divide by 5 now. We know how many cars I can wash in 17 hours. That's cross multiply. Cross multiply is not how you multiply fractions. It's how you yeah. solve proportions. You set two fractions equal to each other, you call it a proportion. Okay. Well, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to get into the next part. That is your homework. We've got some adding, got some subtracting, we've got some multiplying, some dividing, and some fractions. Okay?